And the theme, if I can say it this way, throughout this evening's session is going to be that our personal growth and spiritual growth and development will stop the day we die. It's just maybe in the, put in a, in a very simple and blunt form. And I like how John Maxwell, uh, on the first page, he outlines this quote. Most people go through life. Not too many people grow through life. And I don't have that written here, uh, but it's written in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 52, the Amplified Version. And it talks about Jesus. We sometimes, uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dean preached about Jesus, the Son of Man. We sometimes forget or tend to neglect that not only Jesus was 100% God, Jesus was 100% man. And Pastor Redeem did a great job of outlining why he came in a humanly form, why he experienced so many things. So he can allow us to know, hey, I, can, I feel you guys. I know what you go through. And because I was able to come in that same form, in that same flesh, but being sinless, that's the biggest difference. He was sinless without sin. He's able to now sympathize with us. And what we sometimes tend to kind of, I guess, forget or neglect is that even Jesus, when he was grown up, he had to also grow and mature, not physically. So it's not in your um, notes, but I have it written here. Luke uh, 2.52, it says this. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature, in the favor with God and with man. So even Jesus himself, as he was growing on this earth, in his physical, humanly body, he had to also grow. He had to also mature. For those of you who are mamas in here, or parents, or at least understand biology and how birth works, uh, we understand that uh, there's normal, natural growth of a child, and then there's something they call birth defects. And I'm more than sure that you guys have probably seen children or people who were not physically uh, fully developed uh, because of some kind of um, infirmity in the body or some kind of defect, and they, they sometimes are categorized as Down syndrome, and there's other different type of sicknesses and disease. In other words, that the baby, even within the womb, did not formally, uh, properly was, you know, uh, properly was formed, and when obviously the, the baby was born, uh, you can physically see uh, certain, you know, birth defects or side effects. So we understand that even in a natural process, we as human, uh, human beings, we grow. Sometimes we look at our children, we're not pointing at anybody in this room. It's like, uh, excuse me, uh, why are you taller than dad and mom? But anyway, that's already our personal problem. So we do sometimes wonder, you know, is my son and daughter, they're gonna ever stop growing? You know, they're already outgrown this. So growth and development is a normal process in our regular physical life, earthly life, and so it is spiritually. So here are a couple examples. How important is spiritual growth or personal growth? This is with recent research. If you go on Instagram and you type in the hashtag personal growth or personal development, you're gonna get more than 16 million uh, results, meaning that uh, I'm on Instagram from time to time and I do use hashtags in different variations. And last time when I used that term personal growth, the hot hashtag usually, it's gonna right next to it shows a number, how many times it's been at least utilized uh, in this context. And recently, it was around 16 million times. So people are using that hashtag, personal growth. If you go to Google and you type in personal growth and development, uh, I at least got more than two uh, billion search results. Good evening, Pastor. More than uh, two billion search results. And usually it happens within like a second or two seconds, the search results, depending on how fast you're uh, internet uh, speed is. When you go to Amazon, if you're interested in buying a book or some kind of literature, and you were to type in the same term, personal growth and development, you're gonna get more than 70,000 results. So there's a lot of, in other words, content out there that's actually focused on how you can personally grow and how you can personally develop. And with that theme, I'm going to actually, we're going to talk about tonight uh, concerning our spiritual growth, concerning our spiritual maturity. Why is that important? Why is that a necessity for all of us? And when we read in Ephesians, who can help me read this nice and lengthy Bible passage? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. And Thank you. And some as pastors and teachers to fully equip and perfect the saints for works of service to build up the body of Christ until we all reach oneness and the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God 
to become a true believer, reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ. So that we are no longer children, tossed back and forth, and carried out of every wind, wind of doctrine, by the cunning and trickery of men, but by the deceitful scheming of people, ready to do anything. But speaking the truth in all but speaking the truth in love, let us grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, who is the head of Christ. From him the whole body, joined and knitted, firmly together by what it's a great way. It's okay. <laughs> From him the whole body, joined and knitted, firmly together by what every joint supplies, when each part is working properly. So here, Apostle Paul, he goes into detail, uh, outlining the importance of what it means for us to grow. <clears throat> Growth, he also puts it together that it brings unity. So just a few bulletin points outlined, and I also have them in bold font from this passage. One of them is to fully equip and to perfect the saints. That's a term he uses for those who are followers of Christ as saints. So we can become equipped and become perfect. Next point Apostle Paul outlines is for us to build up the body of Christ. This is very key. This is very essential. So for an example, if a person is either born with a physical deformity, like for an example, one of their arms is shorter or it didn't fully grow up, we understand that that person is going to be limited up to a certain degree. Not unless if you're a Nick Vujicic, he has no arms, no legs. He's an exception to the rule. He's done more things than I have ever done. I just actually recently gave uh, my son a book. I think it's called Unstoppable. And right in the book cover, it shows Nick Vujicic surfboarding. Again, remember, he has no feet and no hands. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm, not, I'm talking about, you can research this person. Very remarkable, remarkable man of God who eventually did get married. All of his kids were born with full legs and arms. So the point is this, that we understand that whether a person was born with an infirmity, missing maybe a certain body part, or maybe throughout their life, through an accident or something you know bad happened, and now they're in a wheelchair, they're missing a leg and arm, of course that's going to limit that person to function to the fullest capacity. It's not going to limit the person to live, but it will limit them in certain capacity of their life. So here Apostle Paul, he's challenging us as readers by saying, look, uh, when we come to the full maturity in Christ, and one of the points is it's to build up the body of Christ. So when all of us as God's children in this local church or overall in the body of Christ, when we're all functioning in our gift, in our skill, in our ability, that means we're able to bring unity. So if I know I need two hands to carry something, but maybe I'm missing a hand or, or one of my hands is tied, well, it's going to be kind of heavy if I have to carry something heavy, it's, you know, it's... It's, it's like, I don't know, 40, 50 pounds. I will only be able to carry it so far and so long until I have to put it down, take a break. But for those of us who have maybe carried certain heavy things, you perfectly understand that when you use two of your hands, you're actually not only distributing the weight, but you're also able to what? It's lighter in your body, and you're able to bring it a little bit more further than you would with one hand. So that's what Apostle Paul's showing us. So we can build up uh, in the body of Christ. Next point Apostle Paul says is oneness in faith. So we can all be in one faith. So we can all be in one spirit. So we can all move in that area. That's the missing word. Oneness in faith. So we're able to actually function in that gift. And so we can be moving in the same direction. It's like almost like a, a G GPS. If the GPS tells you, go straight, you're going straight. Uh, as soon as you, you know, you're going to get off the, well, you're not supposed to get off the wrong exit. The GPS is like, oh, hold on, I got to recalculate. So that's what it means for the body to be in agreement, for the local church to be in one faith, in one agreement. It's like, hey, this is our local church, this is our vision, this is what we believe in, this is what we're moving into. But all of a sudden, some people in church, well, I don't believe in that. No, I don't agree with that. I don't want to do that. Of course, for us not being on the same page, it's going to obviously bring some division, divisiveness, and so on and so forth. Another point Apostle Paul outlines in the same context is to become a mature believer. As he's challenging us, we need to become mature, we need to grow. Another point, he says, so we can grow spiritually. Again, he's incorporating these similar words, to grow, to mature. And one more point, he says, that the body, in the scripture, which means the church, to also grow and mature. 
And Apostle Paul keeps on repeating these similar examples over and over again. So we, as one body, can function together. So when it comes to spiritual growth uh, and development or spiritual maturity, it's not only personal, it's also corporate. Does that make sense? Not only I have to personally grow in spiritual growth, but also as I spiritually grow, together, us as the body of Christ, together, us as a local church, we're growing together. Because uh, another passage, I believe we read it last week, Apostle Paul gave an outline that, about different body members. Where the eye says, well, the eye says to the ear, I don't need you. The right hand says to the leg, I don't need you. No, no, no. Every physical body part has its own function. And in this like manner, we as the local church or we as the body of Christ, we also fulfill a specific purpose and a specific function. For an example, why is uh, growth and development very important? Uh, who here has ever had like uh, some work done in your teeth, whether it was big or like drilling for holes? Oh, I mean cavities. Anybody have like heavy duty work done? Not regular cleaning. Yeah. Anybody ever went to the dentist with the exception of cleaning? We're talking about drilling or maybe yeah. dent or whatever. How many of you went without getting numb, novocaine or put to sleep or tooth extract? Anybody did it 100% natural? Back in okay, okay, we have one. Okay, so <laughs> <many days>. <laughs> <laughs> That's an exception. That would chat always. No. I believe you, Pastor. Yeah. That's a whole different world. But my point is, you don't do that. Why? Because it will be very painful. Very and usually, uh, you know, when the doctor, you know, dentist gives you the Novocaine or they numb you, uh, you know, they use different methods, they'll usually say, once they start drilling, do you feel that? You're like, oh, I kind of feel that. I had to have a couple of times. They go in again and give you another shot. You're like, oh, that's not what I wanted. But okay. Now, by that time, they gave me a little extra do dose. Not only am I not feeling anything, I'm already drooling. I'm like, oh, it's a little too much there, doc. <laughs> so... We understand that through uh, technology, through research, they've you know, come up with, you know, like with shots or something that numbs your physical body so you won't feel pain. That's normal process of growth and development in our culture. But can you imagine you going to your dentist right now in the year 2023 and you're like, uh, I don't believe that stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I've never heard of that before. And you're like, geez, doc, uh, where in the world did you go to school? Well, you might say I'm from former Soviet Union anyway, who knows, <laughs> as we already heard from the pastor. So we understand that even in our culture, in our society, technology is improving. Health is improving. The way of life is improving. There was a time for a long, long time people walked on feet or rode a donkey. Then bicycles came around, then cars, and then we're flying airplanes. So as much as in our world and society, normal growth and development is normal, how should that be any different for us as God's children, okay? So that's why spiritual growth and development is important. On the following page, just a couple points concerning this Bible passage is this. Your spiritual growth, the missing word, is not only important to you, but it is also important for the body of Christ. That means your local church, as I mentioned earlier, and for the bringing of kingdom influence wherever you go. So again, not only it's important for me to grow, but my spiritual growth and development actually benefits and blesses my local church. That's very essential. That's also true for any father or mother, that when they go through certain growth and development, both spiritual and natural, it benefits the family. One more point. Your spiritual growth determines your level of effectiveness, success, productivity, and influence in your personal life your local church, as we already mentioned, and everything you do for the glory of God. This is very important. Here's a question. Could it be possible that one of the reasons why a local church does not have specific influence in its local community because for the fact that it has people or leaders who are not spiritual grown and maturing? You guys grab that? Yeah. One of the reasons why they don't have that influence, they're just a regular church folks. They love God, but that's as far as it goes. They come to church and nothing changes. And this is very important and very essential. I'm trying to see where I was going to be using that example. One second, one second. I want to make sure I don't jump ahead of myself. I could possibly use that. Years ago, when our church, when I used to live in Massachusetts, uh, we ended up buying this big church building. Uh, it kind of looked like a chapel, but bigger, with a pointed roof. 
in a three-story brick house, I don't know, you know how many square feet, maybe 8,000 square feet, and built and attached to the building was a banquet hall. So it was like these three type of facilities, all under one price tag. And back then, that was in Chicopee, we got it literally pennies to the dollar. You think, wow, what happened, you know? That was a former uh, Catholic church. Eventually they had to sell. And one of the main reasons why they had to sell their facility was because their church membership was going down at an extremely rapid rate. And anybody understands that when you have no growth, when you don't have people coming, and there's no physical people coming, like physical growth, that means you're gonna feel it financially. Your tithes and offerings are gonna really, really drop. So what's the history behind that? Uh, when we purchased the facility and we were actually doing renovation work, right down the street we went uh, to a local pizzeria and we were getting some pizzas so we can bring it to the church and you know, feed everybody. And as we were talking to the owner of that pizzeria, uh, he's like, oh, where are you guys from? You know, it looks like you got some dust in you. I'm like, oh, we're doing some work around here. He's like, what kind of work? Like, I didn't know there was like, some kind of construction work. He's like, oh, we're working in this church. He's like, what church? And we told him, like, literally, we're walking distance. He's like, what are you doing there? Like, well, we ended up purchasing it, so we do our nation work. He's like, really? What organization are you from? Like, who purchased them? Like, well, we're also Christian believers, and we, we bought that for our own church. He's like, oh, wow, that's awesome. It's good to know that, that my former church is going to be used for another church. We're like, oh, really? You used to go there? He's like, yes. To make the long story short, he said, we asked him, I said, what happened? Why did the church close its doors? He goes, there was a time we used to have an average Sunday attendance of 500 to 600 people. He goes, but you've already probably heard that uh, in recent years, specifically in that greater Springfield area, a lot of sexual allegations went against the Catholic priests. Mm -hmm. If anybody's been following the news, this was about roughly 15, uh, 17 years ago or so. In the region where we live, it has a high Catholic population, one of the highest in America when it comes to Catholicism. In that region where we, um, where I grew up in at that time, uh, some of the biggest allegations with the highest dollar figures. So if you were to take, like, I don't know, for an example, a hundred million dollars worth of, uh, you know, allegations against the church and the priests, a good percentage of that was focused just in our geographical location. So this is what the guy said. He goes, it's sad that it all happened with our priests and that. So people, he said, in our community begin to lose faith in our church and in our leadership. That eventually affected the younger generation. The younger generation stopped coming because... Uh, that most of the victims were from the younger generation. So here's the point with all of this. That church uh, took a big hit because of uh, something that happened also through that church partially and also that umbrella that they were under in that region, in that specific geographical location. So their community lost trust in them. So I think the challenge for us is when it comes to uh, both either spiritual growth and maturity, it's not only a personal thing, but also how we live our life. Also, how we present ourselves. I remember not too long ago, we were asking a question. They said, hey, you know what? If I mention this church's name or this ministry's name, what, what's one of the first things that will come to your mind? I'm not going to use any examples. And the person's like, oh, this and that. I'm like, yeah, it's true. How do you know that? Well, it's because that's how they, you know, got their name out there. That's what they're good at. I'm like, man, that's awesome. And then I started naming some, uh, you know, brand names. I said, you know, if you look at the shoes and you see like kind of like a swoosh on it, they're like, oh, that's Nike. I'm like, how do you know? It didn't say Nike on it. It's like, because I'm familiar with the logo design. I said, it's interesting. I said, how we can become very familiarized with certain names, titles, images, or logos. And then I asked this person this question. I said, you know, we attend the same church, and I'm talking about our church. I said, what would you want people in our local community to say about us? Or to remember us for? Or to know us for? That person's like, ooh, that's something to think about. One of my greatest desires is for our local community to really know a new life of what we're doing with the kids and the younger generation. That's one of my greatest passions desire, and I also know that's also our senior pastor's heart and desire. So out of all the hundreds and whatever amount of churches in our greater county foresight, if we can stand out in something, let it be something of that nature, where they're like, hey, you know what? Whatever kids program is happening, that's where you wanna bring them. So that also involves growth and maturity. People are not going to just going to come to our church just because we have a big banner and we send out, you know, 10,000 mailers to their homes. Oh, cool. You guys did something cool out of marketing. But we also have to back it up with what, how we plan, how we organize, and etc. Even though we have um, 
you know, uh, our kids camp, you know, still time ahead. Well, there's already been people preparing and planning for that event because it takes time, all right?